Thank you very much. So, as like everybody else, uh, I am extremely thankful, pleased, and amazed to be here not only in this particular place, but also in this very, very special, you know, top notch uh, audience. Um, and <clears throat> as you can, of course, imagine, I started 20 years ago to prepare exactly for this uh, particular uh, uh, um, logo of the, our conference, because this uh, is really something which represents quantum control. You have some macroscopic uh, uh, tool by which you manipulate a quantum device. Um, and actually, what I'm going to focus is, uh, and I have not contracted the, 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 you know, the painting of this to just show that one main feature here is uh, some wiggles. We have some to wiggle some <coughs> field, obviously, to do this macro macroscopic manipulation. So, uh, and this is useful at different levels in the quantum stack. So, of course, you start from hardware, and this is <coughs> some of the most interesting and important part from which we have heard a lot. Then there is something which is firmware, which goes a little bit <coughs> on top of that, and then you want to compile gates, and then to do the most interesting thing, which is algorithms and software. So, obviously, the most interesting part, the most juicy part is hardware and algorithms, and so I will focus on the rest, which is firmware and compilation, the boring part. And so <coughs> what I'm going to explain is how to use quantum optimal control methods. You can say that quantum optimal control is you know, a, a branch of uh, uh, machine learning, of supervised learning, or vice versa, even if you wish, uh, depending on your point of view. <coughs> but what I am going to show is how to use these methods for each and every one of the steps that you need to create, for instance, a neutral atom uh, or an AMO-based uh, um, quantum simulator or computer, um, including uh, going down to, to the line of really synthesizing it in a, in, a, in a more general way, which is about, uh, um, you know, going towards computation. So here is, <coughs> if you take that hand that, uh, that uh, you know, we see in the, in the logo of our workshop, and you try to use it to manipulate some classical object, like in this game, well, you have some, some goal, you want to go through some path, and you have some external parameters that can manipulate. And there are only a few control parameters. And then, of course, in the quantum domain, you have some difficulties. Because there is, <coughs> first of all, you cannot uh, uh, look inside, right? Uh, otherwise, you will collapse the wave function. Um, there are many things that you want to do, not, not only going from one state to another state, but maybe also prepare some unitary transformation, some gates. You want to avoid, of course, losses. And <coughs> you have some very large and clumsy tools to do that, because it's like doing this with, by you know, not looking at this, like blindfolded, you know, using uh, boxing gloves instead of your hands to, to turn this, and doing this in a very noisy environment, meaning like on a, on a tractor trailer going down the slopes of the Vatican at 200 miles an hour, in which you know, everything possible is happening, and still you have to go to the goal. So <coughs> I'm going to show how this can work. Not only that, but you want also to uh, dispose of PhD students, or perhaps dispose of boring stuff which PhD students have to, to do in automatizing the most boring uh, aspects. Like you want a machine which can actually do this so that your students can do some more interesting stuff. And so this is what we <coughs> are doing with uh, these optimal control methods. The idea is, again, you have a certain Landscape, of course, you have a certain cost function, which will have maxima and minima, depending on, the, on all the infinitely dimensional possibilities that you uh, have in your control functions. And you want to minimize a, uh, or optimize a very important uh, uh, quantity, which is very important in my own field, in our field, and also in this country, which is fidelity, right? So fidelity is a very important figure of merit, and we want to get up to the hill as much as possible. Of course, we have constraints. Uh, in the sense that there are some regions of the landscape which we cannot access because maybe this is too much power that we want to do, or maybe this will lead us to some lossy parts of our Hilbert space. So there are constraints, and we want to maneuver through the, this whole landscape in some hopefully clever way. So <coughs> here is one method that we developed to do this, you know, starting from a certain guess uh, time dependence of your control parameters for your system. You know, we use our CRAB method, which consists in uh, writing <coughs> your update function as a function of uh, as a sum of a few a truncated sum over a few mm, mm, possible basis functions. It could be you know Fourier mm, uh, components. It could be polynomials. It could be anything. And then <coughs> what you want to do is you uh, update your your pulse in terms of uh, reducing it to a few parameters. If you do that, then your landscape really becomes like a two, three, or uh, few dimensional landscape. And your initial guess pulse will be, of course, not in the optimum. So you want to walk downhill in this <coughs> particular landscape. And you can do that with some, I mean, this is a, you know, a depiction of a simplex method in which you have a polytope running down the, 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 the hill. And this has several advantages. 
which is you don't need to, to, to have an analytic description, a gradient. You can even put it in a closed loop. I will show examples of that. And you can synthesize a, a pulse shape, which is actually corresponding to what is feasible in an experiment. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is, of course, to apply it in experiments. But this means that I will have additional constraints. So I may have, for instance, local minima. This is a typical uh, problem. And you can never be sure mathematically that you are optimizing, but you have to play, you know, you have to get your hands dirty and play with the, with the system. And one way we can use to, to play here is essentially the following, that you know, since the shape of the landscape depends on your function space, it depends on how you truncate your expansion, if you get stuck in a local minimum, you can just uh, throw away one of your uh, uh, basis functions, and then the shape of the, um, the landscape will change, and you can go downhill more. So you can escape local traps by engineering your landscape in such a very simple way. And so <clears throat> this is something which can, you know, you have a, a black box. In the black box, typically, simulation and experiment, you know, equipped with a student is sitting, which is running something. And then, you know, in this black box, you input some, some path shape. Then the student, the machine, the whatever, will sort of uh, apply to the system. And then you will get a figure of merit. And you can, of course, use it in an automatic loop without even knowing, in principle, anything about your, your system, <coughs> just by iterating and synthesizing the best pulse shape that you can have. And you can do this also remotely, in the sense that you can have a, a, a client, which is doing the feed, feeding the pulse shape and retrieving the figure of merit. And then, over the internet, you can actually optimize this by running your, your algorithm. Actually, I mean, in our lab, or you can, we can, we are actually even starting to, so we have a startup starting to commercialize that as a, as a software, as a service, in principle. So here is the simplest and uh, <clears throat> most uh, uh, trivial example of doing that, trivial in the sense of the operation that we are doing. So this is um, uh, in the context of quantum sensing. This is an experiment done with Fyodor Yelitsko uh, at the time in Ulm, in which uh, it was about uh, optimizing a certain uh, pulse shape for a single qubit operation on an MV center. And here, it's really in the closed loop. Like, <clears throat> you start with a certain guess, which could be even a, a square pulse which, of course, will have, like, as you see here, around 50% fidelity. And then uh, you cycle this, and then you come back tomorrow morning at 8 AM. You have started yesterday evening. And at 8 AM, you have the fidelity, which is 100% within the experimental error, because it automatically converges there by using this. So at the time, it was just across the hallway. To, to, it was local, just to make sure, because we were uh, all in Ulm, just to make sure that this would work. But of course, I will show examples where it works also you know, on a larger distance. And the first example in which we uh, <clears throat> try to test that is, um, again, a trivial example, something which everybody knows how to do, evaporative pooling to produce a Bose-Einstein condensate by a certain, uh, you know, um, in this case, it was a game. So it was gamified in the lab of uh, Jakob Scherson in Aarhus. What they did was they um, proposed this to, you know, regular people, not just, you know, just scientists. They, these people would get uh, this video in which they show that there is a certain, you know, uh, fluid, which is uh, quite hot, it is um, in a certain uh, you know magnetic uh, containing potential. Then it gets poured into some optical potential, but of course there can be some some uh, you know issues in in doing that. And then uh, <coughs> what happens is that of course, as everybody knows, if you lower the depth of this potential, your coffee will freeze. And this is what happens in evaporative cooling. So this is what they the video that they offered to people to play with this in the sense that the people then would be explained gamers would be explained you can you know manipulate the depth. The, the intensity of some laser fields. There would be uh, an interface, a graphical interface, by which they could really influence the shape. And then the gamers would get a score in terms of how many atoms, after running this particular pulse, how many atoms are in the condensate. And several thousand people played this game. And the uh, <coughs> thing which was interesting for us was, can our machine actually work online? You know, Because this was an online interface, an API, if you wish, in, in, in <coughs> current language. And then, can we actually? Uh, get it work. So we outperform, our algorithm outperforms humans, interestingly, not by far, because actually humans are, are quite clever in doing that. There is a, we developed a lot of theory which, uh, and, and investigation, which I have not the time to, to show here, about all the different classes of, <coughs> of uh, uh, solutions which are, in, in, which are built in this landscape. But for us, this was important just to have a demonstration that our system can really work online and can optimize <coughs> you know, over the cloud an experiment. So everyone is welcome to use that if you would like. But then we want to use it for some <coughs> kind of more relevant stuff. So this is, uh, you know, once you know how that you can evaporate your, your atoms, you can you want to put them in a certain quantum register. So this is an experiment that we that Emmanuel did <coughs> based on our theory. 
Of course, uh, this is something which was very high, is and was very highly optimized in the sense of the, uh, <coughs> the ramp, um, the pulse shape, uh, the ramp profile, which is necessary to go adiabatically from a superfluid to a moth insulator. This is something which, uh, of course, uh, Emmanuel and co-workers have uh, developed uh, more than 20 years ago. This is the first step to prepare a, a quantum simulator, which several of our speakers have, uh, have referred to. And of course, what you want, in this case, the figure of merit is you do not want defect. You want to have one atom per lattice site, and you want to get there as soon as possible. So there had been, uh, over many years, an optimized pulse shape, optimized by hand, by sort of a further refining, which is this yellow curve. And what we wanted to do is, instead of a few hundred milliseconds, to go one order of magnitude faster, which you could do either you know, with some linear, uh, you know, trivial shape, or you could do with the optimized shape by, by our algorithm. And what you get is that, of course, what you want is you know, a zero density of defect in the central region of your lattice, so one atom per lattice site. And if you do this just with um, a simple linear pulse shape, the red shape here, then you get 10-15% uh, defect density in the middle. And then if you instead do it with a fine-tuned optimized shape, you get 100%, uh, <coughs> I mean, within the experimental error of the, uh, um, of the occupancy. And interestingly, this is not bringing a huge uh, uh, you know, improvement with respect to what you could do without optimization, but the important part is it tells you, you know, up down to this time scale, so it goes you to the, brings you to this quantum speed limit, which was mentioned in the previous talk by Sebastian, and <coughs> it tells you, okay, if you have a certain noise floor, you can do it this quickly, and at this stage you will get this, uh, this, uh, this um, fidelity, and it's, it doesn't make sense to try to improve, because if you try to squeeze the time, you see it to shorter times, there's a universal behavior such that the fidelity grows like a cosine square, which can be explained in terms of, of uh, essentially distance in, in the Hilbert space. So you can explore the speed limit of such uh, uh, systems, and then once you have one atom per lattice site, then you want to start manipulating them. So this is, uh, of course, done with ideas which uh, uh, Peter and Ignacio developed many years ago about uh, you know, collision gates, for instance, in optical lattices, and so you want to have a state-dependent lattice. This is in the group of uh, uh, Dieter Mesh and Andrea Alberti in Bonn, in which you can really realize with different polarizations this uh, dependent optical lattice, which uh, you know, creates entanglement and <coughs> moves atoms around. And here you can explore the speed limit in the sense that you have a very precise control of your pulse shape, and you can see how fast... No, this is not really something that I wanted, so this is my iPad wanted to talk to me, so let me switch it off. Sorry about that. So, <coughs> and uh, you can actually manipulate very accurately the, 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 the pulse shape and try to do this uh, process, you know, really in the shortest possible time. Again, you can uh, try to see which fidelity you achieve, because this is essentially a harmonic oscillator which you, uh, in approximation, which you, you move around, so you set some slow motion, there is some recurrence according to the um, time scale of the harmonic oscillator. And so you get uh, these oscillations. If you do this with a linear ramp, of course, in a diabatic limit, you get uh, almost unit fidelity. And then as you squeeze the time, then you will get these oscillations. There are these recurrences. But if you optimize, actually, you can get unit fidelity down to the minimum possible time, which uh, uh, goes with this process, not only in terms of transport, but you can also do transport in a state-dependent way. So this would be uh, the fastest Schrodinger cat. It's a very tiny Schrodinger cat. It's an you know, entanglement between the internal and external degree of freedom during this uh, sort of Ramsey-type experiment. And <clears throat> again, here you get this kind of cosine square uh, universal behavior in a sense, in the sense that um, you know, this is, it tells you the fastest time in which you can realize, given the resources that you have here in terms of potentials and, and, uh, and um, trapping frequencies and so on, you know, uh, at which you can realize this kind of entanglement. So this is um, the tiny, but fastest Schrodinger cut that you can do. And then if we want to go further, we want to do the fattest Schrodinger cut that you can achieve. So this is an experiment which was done um, by Misha in Misha's lab in cooperation with them, also using uh, uh, our algorithm. In this case, uh, so the platform with optical tweezers, you have a little bit of atoms you have already, already seen <coughs> yesterday. And what is relevant here for us is we want to create a GHZ state uh, via some uh, <coughs> transition from uh, you know, a, a state, state in all in zero to the sort of superposition 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, plus 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, which you can go uh, <coughs> do by sweeping, uh, detuning, uh, as, as shown in the picture of the manipulation that you have for, for each of these, these atoms. And then <coughs> here is um, uh, a picture of the 
population in the two uh, 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 branches of the wave function, which is achieved with that particular pulse shape that we have there. And then the oscillations that we see is really in oscillations in a parity measure, which gives us a measure of the fidelity. And what is interesting is that this is surviving. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if you did it, so what I had before was just something that you can do anyway, and you do it faster. Okay, with optimal control, and one could say, so what? It's a, an, an, you know, an improvement of, of, a <coughs> of a small factor. But in this case, we show that um, uh, for this, if you wouldn't use the optimal control, you know, at the level of the 20 atoms by which, which at the time when it was realized was the, the, the biggest and larger Schrodinger cut state, the larger GSD state that was realized uh, ever at the time, you can do this keeping the fidelity up the threshold of 50% only if you are using these optimal control methods. So this is really something which is enabled, which would be impossible without using these methods, and which is enabled by with them. Interestingly, and I don't think I have the picture here, but you can see that actually it is necessary to really excite the state and then de-excite it back, so it is really a coherence between the different uh, many body states and excitations which leads you to, to the goal and the ground state is further depleted, the higher the number of, of atoms that you have there, so showing that really this is an, a, a quantum interference effect. So it is not just going adiabatic or as fast as possible, quasi-adiabatic. So this is, you know, essentially what you can do with, you know, creating all the different components. You put your, you cool your atoms, you put them in, in the register, then you, you, you manipulate them, and then you bring them to, to some <coughs> entangled state. And then once you are there, you want to do perhaps something more. So this is the last uh, aspect that I want to report, a recent paper in which uh, we uh, you know, are using this to build uh, going up in the stack. So creating is not yet compilation, OK? But it's about synthesizing continuous gate sets, because this is something which, in compilation, you can use to have a, a more efficient circuit in terms of you know, a gate set with depending on some continuous parameter. This is something that you can use, for, of course, in in all these uh, variational quantum algorithms, but also more in general, you know, if you can synthesize different gates than just a specific discrete set, you can build more uh, efficient algorithms and a more efficient circuit. So <clears throat> what we want to do is to use uh, uh, now machine learning to achieve that. So this is, uh, <clears throat> we want to sort of learn the best possible way <clears throat> to synthesize a certain continuous gate set. And this is something that we do uh, we call it uh, a single optimization multiple application in the sense that you train a neural network to do that, and then you can apply this in different cases you know, by getting the best possible, so most robust uh, fidelity for your manipulation. There are different versions of, of uh, doing this, so you can do it in a supervised learning way in the sense that you use first optimal control for different uh, values you know, or, or over a broad distribution of possible parameters for your, for your gates, and, <clears throat> and then you want to uh, to you know, mm, learn the, the robust solution, or you could directly, in a single step, you know, use, uh, you know, uh, optimize uh, everything all together in order to, so to learn directly the, um, the approximator, the regressor, which is bringing you to the, to the final solution directly with a backpropagation step in, uh, in uh, um, using this neural network. So <clears throat> this is the results that we get, because I think that my time is essentially at the end. And you can see here that if you compare the results of uh, um, simulating, in this case it is for a, for, a, um, for a single qubit continuous gate, but the same kind of, of separation you get for, for multi-qubit gates, is uh, uh, you, know, you can use different methods for robust control uh, in terms of robustifying and averaging over you know, a broad distribution of, uh, of possible fluctuations in parameters in your quantum gate. And you see that you know, uh, as a, uh, a function of the number of, uh, um, of um, samples that you have in, in uh, you know, training your neural network, you do get several lots of magnitude improvement using machine learning. No big surprise, of course, everybody knows that machine learning is effective, but applying this can really bring us one step closer to more efficient compilation of uh, quantum gates in, in more efficient circuits. So essentially, my message here is that you can do <coughs> you know, a lot of the steps which are necessary as building blocks to make a quantum machine uh, from you know, uh, making the, the device, you know, bringing the atoms, loading them, transporting them up to creating entanglement and synthesizing arbitrary quantum gates by using these optimal control methods, which are wonderfully depicted in the uh, you know, cover page of our workshop. And with this, uh, I think that I'm at the end of my time. So I thank you for your attention.